When you first start on a team, maybe it's your first job, it's not that you don't know what's happening, you don't even know enough to put together a coherent question. Turns out grinding leak code questions makes you good at grinding leak code questions. Where are those linked lists that need reversing? Are you annoying your coworkers and asking too many questions? Where's the bathroom? When are they going to discover that you don't know what you're doing? Am I gonna get pipped? Man, my family is so proud I got this job. I can't get fired. Your new code base has 168,000 lines of code and ChatGPT doesn't know how to solve the bug you've been assigned. It's time to put your big boy pants on and start to become a professional and start adulting. In this video, I'll share with you the central ideas that will help you navigate this new and stressful period in your life and set you up to transition from being the scared new guy to someone that thrives and grows during their long software career. I'll answer viewer submitted questions that relate to the early career period, which will help you in the first few weeks, months, and really years on the new job. If you're new to the channel, welcome. My name is Steve Wynn, Meta, or your overachieving cousin that your mom won't stop comparing you to. And I'm an L7 software engineer. On this channel, we take a structured and engineering approach to your career in life. If you want your question answered, leave it in the comment section below or head over to my Discord and post a question in the advice forum. The forum and discussion there are and it's all for free. I make long form videos, which take a long time to produce. So I just started an email newsletter for topics that aren't enough for a whole video. You can find signup information in the description and follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn to get the absolute latest on my thoughts. Tamastian Klotza asks, what's your advice for junior engineers who might be worried about asking too many dumb questions or making mistakes or bugs while finishing tasks? The thing to realize with newbie questions is that the vast majority of people on your team want to help you and see you succeed. People are willing to help because the expectation is that you'll grow enough to make the investment and time with you worth it. It's also in their best interest to grow you because helping people get ramped up quickly and growing people around them are desirable behaviors that employers generally want to reward. It's a triple win situation and it doesn't work if you don't ask for help. But really, at the end of the day, most people wanna help other people because it's the right thing to do. They might remember being new too and how difficult it was when they first started. So never feel bad about asking questions. The thing to be careful about is being annoying. This is a real risk, but it's really easy to avoid. Make sure you listen to the answers that people give you. The easiest way to annoy people is to ask the same question in different ways when they've already given you the answer. So suppose you were asking somebody how to bake a cake because that's your first task. If they responded, the first step is to gather all the ingredients. Here's where we store the ingredients. Here's where you can find the recipe. And you come back the next day and say, okay, I've gathered the ingredients, what next? You weren't listening and that's annoying. If you came back and asked, hey, I'm stuck on step three in the recipe because I can't find the pans. That's totally fine because you demonstrated that you listened to what they had to say and then proceeded on to the next steps on your own. The second way to make sure you're not being annoying is by demonstrating that you're learning how to fish. There's an old saying, give a man to fish and he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish and he'll eat for a lifetime. You wanna to transition to learning how to fish as quickly as possible. When asking questions, try to get ahead of or anticipate what question you're likely to immediately have. That way you can batch things up. So in my cake example, a good follow-up question would be, hey, uh, where do we store all the recipes? This way, when you get assigned the task of baking a loaf of bread, you'll know how to get started. And you'll start to get this reputation for being really resourceful and being a quick learner. Michael Chow asks, hey Meta, as a junior developer, I am struggling to find out which questions I ask are just me being new to the environment and learning the code base versus me just being a new developer. Is there a way to differentiate the two? I'm trying to limit the amount of silly questions I ask. Okay. If you're an intern or just starting out, you won't be able to distinguish whether your question comes from not knowing the code base or your inexperience as a software developer. It's gonna be unknowable for you. It might even be both. The question, should I write unit tests? If so, how much coverage should I target? Is like a low key deep question that depends on the team's code base and the general software philosophy of who you ask. One thing that you might not appreciate in school or when you are grinding data structures and algorithms questions is that software in the corporate world is a team sport. You're writing code in your team's code base, not your private GitHub repository. Suppose you're on a team and a code base that's two and a half years old and your team is about 10 people on average. That code base represents 25 person years of effort. If you're a junior developer that's just graduated from college, it took more time than you are alive. And in the US, it could rent a car and you couldn't. Embedded in that code base are a set of decisions, opinions, and style of the developers that contributed to it. Only time will allow you to disambiguate what things are in the code base and what things are you as a developer. Don't worry about it. If you're worried about asking silly questions, just take the advice from my last answer. Pablo H asks, hey Steve, uh, do you have any specific advice for interns? 
how to prioritize tasks, how when to ask for help, what to prioritize when working on something, how to choose an intern project team if given the choice. Basu Jane asked a similar question. A lot of people, including me at the L4 level, new grad, feel like they're not doing enough. What is a good way to measure output? I'm not talking about checking in progress once every three to four months, rather every week or maybe two weeks. When you first start in your career and you're on your first team, the critical first step you must complete even before you set up your dev environment is to understand what's expected of you. Question zero to your manager is to understand expectations. This will vary by company and team, so it's really important to understand this. Some teams have an expectation of raw output. Some teams are okay with a low amount of high quality check-ins. Some have a focus on speed of delivery. Others may prefer having more of an operational focus or having expectations around delivering independently. Asking about expectations for your role and level needs to be the first question out of your lips whenever you join a new team and make sure to listen to the answer. You don't wanna be focusing on speed of delivery if the expectation is of high quality outputs. Especially for interns, you don't have a lot of time to head out on the wrong vector. When you check in with your manager, your conversation should be about how you're progressing against expectations or what's stopping you from progressing. Whenever I witness a negative outcome, it's almost always a matter of misunderstanding what the expectations are. For interns and people new to a career, it's never an expectation that they have a set of knowledge or experience to start with. It's about going from zero to one and being a participant in the software development lifecycle. Often, the expectation for interns is that they can make a meaningful contribution by the end of their internship. For junior engineers, it's that they'll be able to participate in all aspects of the software development lifecycle and become independent in a year or two. But your mileage may vary. It all starts by really understanding what the situations are for your situation. Peter uh, asks, what, in your opinion, beside writing good and maintainable code, is the key to stand out in early stage of software developer career? Competition among late and early mid uh, engineers is tremendous, no matter what the country or company size. And I personally think many young people watching your invaluable videos may be thrilled to hear you elaborating on this topic. Competition is a good mindset to have when you're trying to find a job. There are limited spots and many qualified applicants, but it's really important to run your own race once you get a job. The reason is that scope, titles, promotions, it's not a zero sum game. Most companies would simply do more if they had more qualified senior people that were grown internally. Competition within the team is not good for the team. This leads to negative behaviors like withholding information, politics, talking trash behind people's backs, jealousy, and other unproductive drama. Think about it like school exams. There's a test you wanna prepare and do as best as you can. If the test is graded on a curve, in other words, your marks are relative to other test takers, that doesn't change anything. You still wanna prepare and do the best you can, not sabotage other people. To answer your other question about standing out though, the, the best way to stand out early in your career is to become a contributor to the software development lifecycle that can operate independently as quickly as possible. The rate in which you are able to operate with autonomy is the thing that sets you apart from others, not necessarily what you deliver, because likely the things that you're assigned will be artificially scoped down. Undecisive asks a related question. How do you deal with level inflation where people just starting their career a few years are now higher level than you've made in twice that time? So there's a lot here and I have like four answers to this question. The first is similar to the previous question, which is you've got to run your own race. If people your age are killing it, good for them. Don't be a hater. If you know them well enough, ask them how they were able to accomplish it. Maybe you can learn something. There are people half my age with billions of dollars. I don't let it get to me. There's also something that I've spoken about on my channel before, which is that comparison is the thief of joy. People on social media only share the good stuff with the rest of the world. They don't share their insights. When you compare yourself to others, you're comparing their outsides to your insights. It's unproductive and unhealthy. Your mom is always gonna compare you to that successful cousin of yours, but I guarantee you your auntie is comparing your cousin to another successful person. There's no winning here. <laughs> There's also a concept of getting promoted too quickly. When you get promoted, your scope increases. If you're not prepared for expectations at this new level, you can run into performance issues and it may make finding a new job difficult at that new level. So for example, if you promote an intern to senior engineer, that first paycheck is gonna be really sweet. But if I had to guess, more than likely that person's gonna have a rude awakening during the next performance review cycle. They just aren't gonna be set up for success. Finally, success is a combination of luck and skill. You can't control the luck part, you can control the skill part. If you focus on growing your skills and capability, success will come and it'll feel like you're getting luckier and luckier. Hang in there and run your own race. You can control that.
Patrick Apgar asks, what are the first steps to reach principal engineer as a new grad software engineer? This will understandably take lots of time and effort throughout one's career, but any advice you can share is always welcome. If not principal, any general tips on obtaining promotions? So you're gonna have to learn to crawl before you walk and before you run. No infant goes straight to the running a marathon. In many martial arts, you start with a white belt, a black belt is the color, which means you've mastered the basics. It seems obvious, but you can't skip steps. Nobody goes from intern to principal engineer in a year in the same way that nobody goes to black belt their first month. Part of the criteria is years of experience. Now, there is a trap, which I'll warn you about, which is people try to optimize for an outcome two steps ahead, but don't meet the expectations of today. The healthiest way to think about promotions is to always make sure you're meeting expectations at your current level before trying to exceed them. If you don't, you'll expend a lot of energy, you won't get promoted, and you'll actually run the risk of getting into performance issues. So what is the best way to get to principal engineer from SDE1? I would say kill it at SDE1, exceed expectations, and get promoted to SDE2, and do it again at that level. Young Meta asks, what are some of the things to keep a lookout for when you start your new career? My biggest piece of advice is that early career isn't going to be the first time you're the new guy on the team. I've had 18 different managers over the course of 17 years. Sometimes these managers were replacements. Sometimes I got a new manager because I moved teams. In any case, each time I needed to make sure that I understood the expectations on this team. And oftentimes I needed to ramp up on new code bases and new team members. Here are the things that I would look out for that aren't positive. The first is support. Some teams don't have a good support mechanism for new joiners, and you may feel like you're being hung out to dry. When speaking with your manager, make sure on top of setting expectations that you understand the details of the support structure as well. If the support isn't there, then ask what they're doing to put that support structure in place for you or how expectations can be reset. The second is dysfunction. Some teams are high performance and some teams are not so high performance. Rife with backstabbing politics, difficult coworkers, unreasonable deadlines, terrible spaghetti code bases, and a toxic or ineffective manager with no support structure. When you're new, none of this can be flagged because you don't even know what you don't know. My general rule of thumb is that none of this becomes apparent until about six months in. There's not much other than to find a new team within the company or to find a new job at a new company if you get into this position. So prevention is key. If you have multiple offers, make sure to be choosy and ask some pointed questions to prospective team members and managers. Bad managers tend to lack tenure on the team and to lose their most senior and effective people. Asking managers how long they've been on the team and what the tenure of the senior engineers that report into them is, is important information. The manager has been on the team less than six months and all the seniors left. I might avoid that team compared to another team with a manager who's been managing there for five years and senior devs who have stuck with them, all things being equal. This of course is all predicated on having options. So. But the biggest thing to remember is that you will be the new guy on the team many times in your career. Get good at asking really good questions. There's an advantage to being new. You get a free pass to be the idiot in the room. These questions sometimes lead to an unexpected big impact on the direction of your new team. Which brings me to today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. I've talked a lot in this video about how getting up to speed quickly is the best way to stand out. I think that the best way to learn quickly is by doing. Brilliant is the best way to learn math, science, and computer science interactively. I believe that reading text passively gives you a shallow understanding of a concept. With the rise of AI, it's important to understand how things like machine learning work underneath the hood. Most people outside of software have no idea how neural networks work. I was impressed with Brilliant's interactive course on neural networks. You can draw characters on screen and actually see the network and activations light up. You can also interact with the weights and observe the effect on the sigmoid function. I wish Brilliant had been around when I was learning all of this stuff. It would have saved me a ton of time. Brilliant has lessons on everything with new ones added every month. The one on quantum computing caught my eye and I'm going through it as we speak with the goal of having a meaningful conversation about the advances that are happening every day in that space. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash alifeengineered or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. If you enjoyed today's office hours, click here to see the previous session. If you have a question you'd like answered, leave it in the comment section below. I hope you have an excellent day. Thanks.